Hey, Jared here. A couple of real quick housekeeping notes before we get to this episode of Assembly Call Radio. In the last episode, I mentioned that the Banner Morning episodes, we were going to move them to their own feed. Several of you have let me know that it's not available yet a couple of places. That is because we're having a delay in it getting up on Apple Podcasts. So in the meantime, I'm going to put those episodes back in the main feed so you will see them. And then I'll let you know once it's actually up everywhere else, you know, once it's up in Apple Podcasts, all the different places, then we'll move it over there. Um, If you're subscribed to that individual feed, we'll still populate that feed, but we're also going to put them in this feed just to make sure everybody can get them who wants them. Sorry about the confusion on that. I thought it would be an Apple Podcast. It's not yet. So I'll get that figured out and then we'll put it onto its own feed. And the last note, you know, I just want to thank everybody who has submitted donations over the last few days. At last check, we have, you know, just a few hundred dollars left to hit our goal uh, of $11,000, which basically will help us fund the show uh, throughout the entire season. So really appreciate it. By the time we, you know, I go get all the checks that that typically come in, we may actually be at the goal. Um, but, you know, if you still are interested in donating, it's assemblycall.com slash donate. But man, we just appreciate it so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who believes enough in us, believes enough in our show uh, to support us financially. I, I, I can't really describe how how much we appreciate that, what it means to us, and how much it motivates us to to deliver a good show to you all. So really appreciate it. It's assemblycall.com slash donate. If you're still interested in contributing, we will uh, we'll keep that up, but we're almost to our goal and we have you to thank. So thank you. All right, that's it. Now let's get to this week's episode of Assembly Call Radio. And welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's Halloween edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most intriguing topics in the world of Indiana basketball. This is our 145th edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 539th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Thursday, October 31st, 2019. I am your host, Jim Hopper. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud banner moment. Now, if you listen to the IU Gannon postgame show, you know that Armand Franklin was the banner moment recipient, and rightfully so. Armand had a terrific game, which was made all the more impressive given the context that it was his first game at Assembly Hall, and he had almost all of the ball handling duties on his shoulders due to the injuries that Devontae, Al, and Rob are dealing with. In fact, as of Monday, when Archie met with the media, Rob was not supposed to play in the Gannon game. But due to some combination of him feeling better than expected after Monday's practice and Al Durham's lack of availability, Archie and the medical staff earmarked 12 minutes for him to play against Gannon. The stated goal was to get Rob into some live competitive action to help him knock the rust off since he hasn't practiced hardly at all in October and to see how his body responded to it. Given the panic that ensued after Archie's ominous description of Rob's injury on Monday, it was encouraging to see that he is at least healthy enough to play in a game. That assuages some of the worst concerns that we all had. But anyone who watched him out there on the court Tuesday night knows that Rob wasn't Rob. He played like a guy who hasn't practiced much this month, tentative and out of sync. On one transition opportunity, he treated the ball like a hot potato, passing to Race Thompson rather than confidently leading the break himself. And in rhythm, Rob Finnessy would never have made such a decision. But there were a couple of moments when Rob did look like Rob, and they are this week's banner moment. At the 212 mark of the first half, Gannon took a one point lead at 29 28 as unease swept across Hoosier Nation. Indiana then went on a 9 0 run to end the half, with Rob notching the final five of those points to give Indiana a 37 29 lead and momentum that they would build on to begin the second half. The first bucket was an inside out three pointer off a pass from Trace Jackson Davis. Rob had missed his previous three shots. But true to his well-earned nickname and reputation, Big Shot Rob stepped up to drain the most important shot that he took. That three-pointer gave Indiana some breathing room and allowed everyone to exhale. He followed that up with two free throws in the final seconds. As I've said many times over the last couple of weeks, every optimistic outlook for this Indiana season begins with Rob Finnessy taking an important step forward as a sophomore. And to use Archie Miller's own term, it's concerning that Rob and Devontae have had to miss so much preseason practice time. But with the season set to begin next week, we can at least take solace in the fact that Rob was able to play on Tuesday and that when big shot opportunities presented themselves, he was able to shake off the rust and take advantage. 
All right, now let me introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show. Andy is off this week, probably now at home sorting through candy with his daughters after a night of trick-or-treating. I cannot confirm reports that Andy dressed up as Joe Lenardi again this year for Halloween, but that is what I'm assuming. Uh, no. All right, well, to my left... He remembers the days when a movie cost a dollar Heaven help you if you ever decide to pop your collar Play hard, but remember, fake hustle is a crime He's the coach and it's Tonsoni time Coach, it's Tonsoni time. What's on your mind? Well, it was uh, great to be back in Assembly Hall last Tuesday for uh, the exhibition and we're just, you know, we're just a few days away from the start of, of Indiana basketball regular season play. So it's quite an exciting time. The thing that I, I took away from this week was it looks like a basketball team again. I don't know how many wins it's going to be. And, and I'm not sure if, you know, where in the Big Ten Indiana will end up being. But looking at the team defense, looking at the offense, the ball was moving. Uh, multiple players are, are scoring. And I, I just think it's going to be, again, another step, and maybe it's wishful thinking for me, another step back towards what everyone always thinks of Indiana basketball is, is good offense and good defense and, and, and competitive year in and year out. And I think we're going to need to have some patience at times with, uh, obviously, with these injuries and, and bigs guarding smalls and all of that stuff. That is legit uh, concerns. But it was, a, it was an enjoyable time, especially the second half, as we'll talk about the scrimmage here coming up. And I really think that things are are moving in the right direction. We can we can discuss whether it's moving fast or slow or whatever. But um, it was a it was a good start to this um, season against Gannon. Coach, folks in the chat mob, very disappointed that you're not in costume right now. I just I just want to say, but you do you I, do have your mask. But we did I, an audio I, I check did. and it didn't sound good. <laughs> it didn't sound good in the mask, and and it's all about the quality of the show. And always so our first concern. Yes. Yeah, I just I went as coach, uh, you know, so I'm a coach. Um, yeah. Ryan apparently dressed up as Elliot from ET over here. So is that what <laughs> you were going for? Uh, okay, to my right, he is a senior writer for the Big Lead, the official shot doctor of the Assembly Call, and for Halloween, he decided to dress up as his favorite college basketball coaching legend, a walking skeleton with a hairpiece. He is Ryan Phillips. Ryan, what would you like to rant about this week? I, I want to make it clear I was going to dress up as Jared, uh, but he threw me off by shaving his beard. So what? A last minute. Somebody changes your your co- the costume money. By the way, I do think next year that you, Andy, and I should dress up as each other because we've known each other for so long. I think, and Coach can dress up as one of us as well. But we should all dress up like pick one for each and dress up as each other. I think that'd be great. Okay. Uh, I, this isn't scary enough for you guys, is that not? Is it? Um, we'll just let anyway, that hang out there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so anyway, I look. It, it was nice to actually have a. Um, to have uh, uh, something to discuss other than, you know, rumors and things coming out about uh, the team. Nice look there, coach. Um, so I, it, 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 we had an actual game. It was, you know, an exhibition. So it's essentially a glorified scrimmage uh, with, you know, lineups we're probably never going to see again and a couple guys injured and things like that. So first half was a little rocky as we, as you know, we saw, but I, I feel like this team sort of developed an identity that's going to be, it's going to play from inside out. I mean, we begged for size for years from this Indiana team really wanted to see it and see a, a group that can really go at it on the glass and, and score easy buckets inside. And you're going to get that this year. I mean, that's what this team's identity is going to be. You look at the line changes they can make in the post and this is going to be a team that's going to win down low. And it's going to win in the paint. And I think that, you know, we begged for three point shooting in the off season as well, but this team's going to get a lot of open looks because defenses are going to collapse on it because of the size it has. So you're going to have guys who are going to get wide open looks and they just have to knock them down. And unfortunately we didn't get to see a couple of guys who I think we're going to depend on knocking them down a lot play, which is Devonte green and, and Al Durham. Uh, also, you know, we saw Rob Finnessy. It's clearly not a full st- you know, full speed Rob Finnessy, but he's going to be another guy. It's going to have to knock shots down. Um, and so we'll, uh, Jerome Hunter played as well, which was nice to see, but he's going to have to knock shots down better than he did. He went over four from deep. So, you know, these guys are going to get open looks because guys like race Thompson, trace Jackson Davis, uh, Joey Brunk, Deron Davis. I mean, 
all of those guys are going to be able to score it on the interior, going to be able to control um, the interior on offense. And it's going to be really be on those guys to knock down some threes, spread the floor and make that uh, their jobs easier on the interior. But I mean, we saw that. I thought that was the most clear thing we saw is that this team is going to run line changes out there, big guys who could score and, and really control the block on offense. And uh, it's going to be on those, those guards to start knocking down some shots. All right, this week, uh, we will get Coach's reaction to the scrimmage. He wasn't on the post-game show, so we'll get his thoughts. He was live uh, in the arena. Uh, we'll also answer a few questions that you sent in about the scrimmage. And then, with this being the final show before the season begins next week, we are going to go on the record with some predictions, and then we will answer your questions. A whole lot of fun ones sent in, so we may have to spill over into some AC After Dark to answer some of those questions. But all of that coming this week on Assembly Call Radio. Before we get to that, let's talk about tickets. You have a lot of options when it comes to where you get your sports tickets, and this isn't an industry that is known for its growth, innovation, and customer friendliness. But with millions of live event tickets and a price match guarantee, SeatGeek proves that there's a better way. They built the fastest way to find tickets so that you can stop searching for the perfect seat and instead start enjoying it. Just look at the App Store. SeatGeek has over 50,000 five-star reviews. And the reason is because they deliver a better process for buying tickets. SeatGeek pulls together millions of tickets from all over the web, and then they rate each deal on a scale of 1 to 10 with a color-coded system to show the value. Green dots mean good deals, red dots are overpriced. Then they display the tickets on an interactive seat map so you can see right where they are. And every purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can shop for tickets with confidence. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone because it is by far the fastest and easiest way to find tickets. We bought tickets to the Zach Brown concert that we went to last week, which ended up being a lot of fun. We did leave at the intermission, uh, but my daughter had a wonderful time. We brought our three-year-old daughter. We figured we would get diminishing returns if we stayed there longer, so we left at the intermission, but it was great. So thanks to everybody who... uh, uh, chimed in on whether or not that was a good idea. Appreciate it. Uh, and Can a brother get some coupons? Of course you can get some coupons. And you should use these coupons to get tickets to the IU Northwestern game on Saturday. If you can get there, be there. And SeatGeek will give you $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. All you need to do is use our promo code. Download the SeatGeek app today and use the promo code ASSEMBLY for $10 off your first purchase. That's promo code ASSEMBLY for $10 off your first purchase. Okay, gents, let's talk Hoosier headlines real quick before we get to the scrimmage. Uh, some news did break today. Derek Elston leaving the Indiana basketball program. Uh, this was kind of expected uh, for a little while. He's taken a job uh, in Indianapolis. Um, and I think it's, you know, by all accounts, just something that fits kind of where he's at in life, kind of where his family is, not anything about discontent with the program, anything like that. So I don't think it's anything to be concerned about, except for the fact that Derek really seemed to have a positive impact you know, as the director of player development, as a guy that players really trusted and leaned on. Um, so, Coach, any, any thoughts on, on Derek leaving the program? It, you know, it's always tough when one of your own uh, decides to go and do something else. But, you know, Derek gave a lot to the program in coming back and filling a, a very key role for several years. And so there's nothing but – you know, joy, if he's making a move that is good for, for him and his family, which I think this is, uh, I think that's uh, something to be applauded. And we look forward to whenever Indiana can replace him that, you know, we'll find out who, who would fit into that role right now. I think they said they're going to split up all those duties that he had amongst the, the current staff. But we wish uh, Derek, um, Derek's a great guy. I coached against him for years, uh, two or three years when he was at Tipton. Never enjoyed that other than uh, he'd always stop by and say hello at the coach's office. Uh, out of the locker room before pregame, just a quality person uh, through and through. Yeah, he's going to be working with uh, United Fidelity Bank in Carmel as their community development officer. So congratulations to him. You know, we wish him the best. And obviously, we hope that Archie's able to find someone good to step in and fill those shoes. So let's reflect a little bit more on Indiana beating Gannon on Tuesday. You know, Ryan, you talked about it some with what we saw from the big guys and just kind of how that game went. Coach, you were there, uh, and, and by the way, if you're listening on the radio and this is your first time joining us, we do a post-game show after every single game, immediately following the game. Go to assemblycall.com. Uh, you will find us. Subscribe to us on YouTube. We're there live as soon as the game ends. You weren't able to be there with us, Coach, because you were in the arena. You sent us some text messages, very excited about the pregame warm-ups, which apparently were a lot better <laughs> this year. So give us you know, kind of the short version, your overall impressions from being there inside Assembly Hall. 
Well, the, the warm-ups are always something for me that are very important. I, I think if you warm up well and with a purpose, then you're likely to play better. And I thought there were some individuals last year that didn't do that in the times that I was there. Saw something totally different, led by Coach Roberts out there, making sure people were doing things right, doing things at a, at a good pace. So that kind of got the night off to a, a really you good start. Got a man crush developing. Yeah, I have a mad Absolutely. crush on Coach Roberts. <laughs> um so you could hear him when we were in row 32, you could hear him all the way up there. And, and that was a, a good start. And then I thought the first half was just, you know, shaking some rust off offensively. Now Ryan talked about Jerome Hunter. He had open shots. He just hesitated. Like he wasn't sure if this was the shot he should take. If he shoots it right when he catches and gets in the rhythm, I think those are eventually going to go down once he gets used to playing and doing those things. Uh, I said um, in the clip in the, in the community, about his defense, his technique is just struggling right now. It's not his effort, and, and and when he gets back in shape. So I took that away. I thought the second half was really enjoyable from an offensive and defensive standpoint uh, from the play, but it's also good to see coaches going in, recognizing what needs to be done, players listening and making those adjustments, even in an exhibition against the, the you know, the opponent. Uh, you got to you gotta take that for what it is, but you can get some things uh, out of it, and I think overall – uh, some guys are looking good. Armand Franklin is really going to push for a more of an extended role than a lot of people thought uh, uh, at the beginning of the season. And in person, he's just he looks really, really sharp uh, for a for a rookie. OK, we got a couple of questions, Ryan. I'll go to you with this first one from J.D. What takeaway from Tuesday's exhibition game will be most or least relevant come February of this season? Well, I think most is is the size. I mean, Indiana is huge. It's a big team. Even on the wing, they're big. Justin Smith, Demise Anderson, um, Jerome Hunter. These are all big guys with you know usable length as uh, defenders and and rebounders. Um, I think that you know we knew their heights and we knew their size, but seeing it on the floor, that's a lot of big guys. I mean, it is. It's a bit. This is a big team, and and so. I think that's what stood out to me the most is, you know, there's that many guys who can play those positions who have size and length. Then seeing them on the floor together, uh, I think was, was really interesting. Um, I think maybe the least, uh, geez, I don't know what the least was. Um, maybe just Armand Franklin playing that much. I, I don't think there's going to be a game this year unless there's injuries where Armand Franklin is going to be 34 minutes and have to handle the ball as much as he did. Um, so, I mean, while I think that was a positive that to see that he's mature enough to handle that, and that'd be great if there is an injury at some point in the season, he has to step in. You feel a little better about it. Um, I don't think that that's something that we need to, you know, th- think about, oh, that's so great. It's like, well, it was a lesser opponent who's not going to be able to guard him on the ball as well, and he pretty much ran freely through the defense for most of the night. But I don't think we're going to have to rely on that as, as we move forward. You know, th- the thing that I'm not sure whether it's going to be most or least relevant in terms of takeaways is how confident Justin Smith looked handling the ball. I, I thought, like, dribbling the ball, he just looked more confident passing the ball. I think he had three assists, no turnovers again. Um and, you know, what I don't know is when the competition ratchets up, will he be that comfortable and will he be that competent as a ball handler? If he is, that is going to be huge because it will add a new dimension and will give him an opportunity to actually play at the three, succeed at the three, and give us, you know, a chance to play some of those bigger lineups. I don't know. I just know that, you know, for a guy that we've heard really worked on that in the offseason, it was nice in the first game out. To it look, looked smooth. To, to, yeah, it looked better. I mean, he just looked more confident when he was dribbling the ball and with the movements that he was making. And by all accounts, he feels a lot more comfortable, you know, with the way that he's being used and with the offense. So that and could it, be a good sign. We just we won't know until we get there. And I don't know yet how to predict it because the competition just doesn't give us a good enough gauge. Right. And we talked about it in the post game. I said it's it's not about him be, him being able to do it. It's about him knowing he's able to do it because he's got the physical ability to do that. I mean, just, there was one breakaway where he just dribbled in, you know, cut across the defender's face and, and laid it in. And it was just like, dude, you can do that every time down the floor because of your physical ability. And you just have to mentally believe you can. And once he gets past that, that's what we've all been waiting for with Justin is to quit the inconsistency and just believe he can do things like that. Because the the athleticism and the skill is there. It's been there since he stepped on campus. With yeah. Justin, the interesting thing um, is, you know, where is he getting his points? A lot of them were on the break. A lot of them were around the rim. Uh, that's more like a four 
or or at least the transition, can he play that three and come off screens and come off ball screens with that ball handle? Can he score uh, in a set offense? But the, uh, the the good point, too, from him on, on Tuesday was he really didn't force things. He wasn't taking bad shots. He wasn't really making bad decisions at a new position with the ball, you know, facing up a little bit more than what he had in the past. So I think that's, that's a very good uh, start. But again, you, you, w- you got to see him grow into that position if he's going to play the three. And, and we just don't know until you get all the guards back what the combinations are going to really be. Yeah. One more question from Patrick Coach. He said uh, it would seem, you know, with the guards out, Demisi, Jerome, and Justin were asked to guard positions they normally would not. And while it was a Division II opponent, might provide a chance to kind of see them against some faster players. How did you, you know, I think we all mentioned that Demisi looked a little slow in the first half and picked it up in the second half. Overall, how did you think that those three guys did when they were guarding out on the perimeter? Um, I, I thought they struggled, um, but I think that's to be expected when you first get into game action against smaller uh, players. And, and in uh, Jerome's case, the first time, Jerome, it was technique, not uh, his effort. He, he was too open on his stance, which allowed too direct a drive for a quick guard. If he squares that up a little bit, he'll be fine. Uh, Demisi has a recognition issue. It got better in the second half with a little more uh, intensity. And I thought Justin only made a couple mistakes. I thought Justin was okay, but those guys, it's harder to guard out in the perimeter. And and we, we have to be somewhat patient. But yeah, those three guarding the three spot is going to be something to watch. And right now I think it's uh, you know below average, but I think that's to be expected. So that's not a negative. That's just an honest evaluation. They got to get a lot better, but I believe they can probably do it uh, over time. And how great was it the one time Justin got blown by and Trace Jackson Davis was there to erase the shot? I think we're gonna I think we're gonna see some of that this year. That guy has got some defensive ability uh, as a shot blocker. All right, uh, coming up, it is time to go on the record with some predictions. Now that the season is mere days away from beginning, one of our listeners took the time to put together a list of interesting over unders. We will give our picks for those next. Stick with us here on the Assembly Call. This is Verdell Jones. What's better than an epic buzzer beater? A full court dribble and a perfectly placed pass to set it all up. And of course, celebrating with Hoosier Nation afterwards. So join Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach on the Assembly Call after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosiers! Thank you, Verdell. Welcome back to the Assembly Call. You can find all of our content at our website, assemblycall.com. And if you ever want to join the chat mob during our unedited live broadcast or watch those replays and see all the between segment banner, then check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assembly call. I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with Ryan Phillips and the coach, Brian Tonsoni. And it is now time for this week's edition of Mediocre Questions from Jay Horry, which is brought to you by Light Beer, pretty much any national pizza chain, and Jay Cutler's 51 and 51 career record with the Chicago Bears, perhaps the most mediocre 102 game tenure any quarterback has ever had with one team. Ryan, you you look quizzical. Oh, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just okay. trying to think if I can think of a worse one. It's definitely mediocre. It's not the yes. worst. Yeah, it's right in the middle. But it, yeah. but it, yes, it's mediocre. Very so mediocre. That, that's what we do here. Jay loves to send in mediocre questions, and we love to to give answers to them. So uh, this was this is actually a really I just fun got question. the joke. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Welcome to the show, like the, Ryan. All three, all three lines of it. I like. I got the Jay Cutler thing, but I didn't see the first part, and now, now I get it. Okay, good. Any national pizza chain? Yeah, light beer. Got it. All yes. mediocre. Okay, good. Okay, now yeah. that we're all on the same page here. Um, mm-hmm. So what Jay said is, since this is the last Assembly Call Radio before the season officially tips off, let's get some predictions on the record. He said, I think we need some sort of bet between the hosts on who gets the most correct. He's right. And we're going to do a bet. If you have ideas for what the bet should be, you can tweet us at Assembly Call. We will come up with something, but we're going to get these on the record first. Uh, so let's do this. Okay, so we've got a bunch of over-unders. Okay? So it's who gets the most wrong is the loser, we're saying. Yes. Yeah, or okay. the lowest correct score. Gotcha. Yes. Okay. One yes. point okay. for each. Who's going to mark these down? Do we have someone in, is someone in the chat mob want to mark these down? Or I guess we'll we'll just we'll mark we do it on our little okay lunch. we'll mark our answers here okay so first one last season Indiana shot thirty one point two percent from three point range this season better or worse coach what do you uh, think I, I'm saying better 
Okay. I, I'm, I mean, I'm on record with this all off season Same. saying better. So it couldn't possibly get worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So Jay kind of started us off easy there. I think we all, yeah. Just, and I, ho- I hope everybody listening agrees with that. Um, okay. Last you guys season. You play along at home as well. Yes. Yes, you can. Beat uh, the experts. Yeah. Last season, Indiana shot 65.5% from the free throw line. This season, will Indiana shoot better or worse? Coach, better or worse than 65.5%? They're, they're going to shoot better than 65. That might yeah. be a wish, but I think they're going to do it. Mark me down. 65.5% for... sucks. God. Yeah, mark me. Yeah, these so have bad. not been hard so far. No. Mark me is better. They can't get worse. I also like, just don't want to fathom a reality where we shoot worse than That's part of it. God. That's part of I'm thinking, like, I don't want to do a show after they're, if they're shooting that. Yes, I think better as well. No, and man, that's the thing with this season too. Like every free throw is like a referendum on how this team is like practice their free throws. And if we ever miss like three or four in a row, everybody's just going to go nuts. So let's just, let's get the free. The next, this is where it gets interesting. This next one. This one does get interesting. Okay. So last season, Indiana's turnover rate was 17.9%. This season, higher or lower? Where did that rank around? Do you know? I think we were like middle of the pack last year, if I remember correctly. Um, Coach, what do you think on this? Turnover rate of 17.9%. I'm I'm going to say higher and just slightly higher uh, because you're going to have some people, if they go big lineup, handling the ball that, that's not used to it, and, and that may skew things earlier in the season. Um, and you, you still have Devontae. He's going to have a turnover or two every once in a while while he's scoring his 20 points a game. So, um no, I think I think it's going to be a little bit higher, but not crazy higher, and not enough to hurt the team. Yeah, I really want to say lower because I think it's so important for this team to limit turnovers and get offensive rebounds. But I have a hard time seeing it for a lot of the same reasons you said. And you know, we're you know one sprained ankle away of a guard, you know, of having a, a really thin guard rotation that you got other guys handling the ball. So I agree. I just think you're going to have some inexperienced, bigger guys handling the ball more. I, if they can get it under that, man, it's going to be a good sign. But I also think it'll be slightly higher this year. Yeah, I right. think we're going to be roughly the same, but I think it's going to be slightly higher just because of the same reasons that Coach did. You've got big guys handling the ball more. You've got Devontae Green. That said, Rob Finnessy is really good at not turning the ball over, and he's going to be the point guard if he's healthy. So, ee, But I think that's going to balance out. I think they're going to wind up roughly about the same but higher. Yeah. Okay. I mean, last year, turnovers weren't didn't wind up being that big a problem. They felt in the moment like they were a big problem, but they really weren't. The problem was not taking advantage of your offensive possessions more than it was turnovers. Yeah. Like is it, you know, like it was one of those things. It was like, it depended on the game. Like they were a huge problem against Arkansas. Cause you save a couple of those possessions. Right. You probably win that game, but overall for the season, you know, they were okay with it. Um, all right. Adjusted tempo last year was 215th fastest in the country. This season. Do you think Indiana will play faster or slower? Ryan, why don't you go first on this? I'll one? go. I'll go faster. You think they're going to play think, faster? I don't think it'll be by a lot, but I think they'll play faster. Yeah. Interesting. See, I think, I think what well, I, is, I think that I think the basketball is getting faster, and I think they will play faster than they did last year. I think this team is set I, up. That's, to, yeah. that's year. I'll jump in and I will say faster because I think what Ryan said is exactly right. That ball's popping, and, and and Archie's constantly asking for them to get going early into offense. And if you look at that first four minutes of the screen, hmm? isn't it taking it down the floor? And I think that's just gonna. I also think higher than what we did in the past. I think they're going to score a lot of quick buckets in the paint too. So I think that's going to speed them up. Like getting it up the floor, getting it to a guy who's in good post position. Ideally, I think we will play faster. I do think Archie wants to play faster, but my gut reaction on this is that we're going to play a little bit slower because of how much we want to get the ball inside and because of how long some of those actions can take how much inside out we're going to do now, obviously if we can get out and transition more, those possessions are going to be a little bit faster, but with as much as we want to play inside and, and especially like early in the season, as we develop chemistry, I just think we're going to have kind of some long stunted possessions. So we I finally I, not agreed on everything. Yeah, so I, I kind of my gut feeling here is that we're going to play a little bit slower. I don't it's not necessarily bad. I mean, Virginia for years has played like the slowest pace ever. So it's not necessarily a value judgment, but I just think it'll take us a little bit longer to get into some of these actions that we want to get into and to get the ball inside, get it outside. So I'm going a little bit slower. First disagreement. First I disagreement. I can go. Okay. I can go. I can go first on the next one. 
I feel like bad uh, making coach go almost every time first. So. Okay. Uh, effective field goal percentage. Last year, Indiana was 51%, which was 167th or 162nd in the country. So a little slightly better than average. This season, better or worse than 51%. Better if the field. If I'm saying the three point percentage is going to be up, and I think we're going to be scoring a lot at the rim with the inside presence. So I'm going to say better. If those uh, things are true, you're going to be you're going to have a higher effective field goal percentage. Yeah, I, I think I think just personnel and style of play will lead to better. Yeah, I think so too because I do think the three point percentage will be better. I don't know if our two point percentage will be quite as good as it was last year because Romeo and Juwan were so good. But it's still going to be good. I mean, Duran and Joey Brunk are elite offensive players in terms of efficiency, you know. And so, you know, with those guys, this is going to be and, too. And Justin is too when it comes to field goal percentage, you know. So I agree. I think something would have to go really wrong if our effective field goal percentage isn't better uh, this and, year. I mean, just just by the three point shooting alone, the three point shooting goes up a couple notches. It kicks your effective field goal percentage way up because of the the value of the three. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, last season, Indiana's adjusted defensive efficiency was 32nd in the country. This season, better or worse? Coach, it's why don't you be- take this one first? Oh, okay, Coach is going. I'm going to say better just because it's the third year of the defense and the size will, will create, just like you said, tr- uh, TJD swatting things when there are mistakes. Uh, I think that's going to increase, and I think uh, we have a chance to be top 20. I agree. You know, we've talked about the third year jump in the pack line, all of that stuff. The one thing that gives me pause, and it's absolutely just prisoner of the moment recency bias, is to me what where I've had confidence with our defense all offseason is that I, I feel like our guard defense is going to drive it. And I feel like we're going to have some of the best guard defense in the country, but we got to get these guys healthy. And yep. so if those guys aren't healthy, then I think the defense could be around the same or a little bit worse. I think they're that important. But if they're all good to go, then I think I think we could be a top 20 defense. So I'm going to predict better, but I'm a little wary about it just based on what we've seen the last few days with injuries and stuff. I'm saying better. I think it's going to be a top 16 uh, adjusted defensive efficiency because you look at that size, as, as you guys have talked about, that weak side defense coming over to help uh, on the inside with Trace Jackson Davis, I think even with Race Thompson can get up there and get in the mix. And I also think these guys are going to have a competition amongst themselves. Who's going to block more shots? Who's going to be more physical defensively? Those guys are all going to push each other on the inside. You're not going to see guys coasting through the rim for layups as much this year. Um, I, you know, We might give up three-pointers, but we're not going to give up easy layups this year, I don't think, once this team is used to playing with each other. Yep. Uh, okay, this is a really interesting one. Last yeah, season, 9.7 offensive rebounds per game. This season, higher or lower? Where did uh, that rank? Do you know? Uh, I don't know where that number ranked. We can certainly go look and see where our offensive rebounding percentage ranked. I'll, I'll open up Ken Palm while you guys talk about this. Um, Ryan, why don't you go first? I think more just because of the size. Uh, the last year, they were wildly undersized. I think you're you're just going to get more. It's hard to get any offensive rebounds in the Big Ten. Uh, it just is in general because of the size and the the discipline of the interior players in this conference. I'm going to say more just because there's going to be more active size playing, and, and that eventually leads to better rebounds. Now they've got to be disciplined. They've got to attack the glass and all that. But I think I think they're gonna they're gonna raise that number. Last year, we were 187th in the country with an offensive rebounding yeah. percentage of 28%. Um, Juwan was the best. He w- he had an offensive rebounding percentage of 9.9%. So you got to replace that. Coach, what do you think? <clears throat> I, I think it's going to be higher, and, and that's going to be something that maybe gets better as the season goes on, okay. as players understand how to be aggressively uh, pursuing the ball without going over the back, without doing certain things. Um the athleticism the other, that we have with race and yeah. um, and TJD and then, you know, Davis can get some and Brunk is just a, a fighter. I think you're going to fall into at least double digits. Something to remember here. The number of offensive rebounds goes down the more shots you make. It Correct. can't. But I'm going to say it's going to go up. Yeah, and you know Brunk has been a good offensive rebounder. He's had good offensive rebounding percentages. Uh, you know, look, I think this has to be better because again, I yes. think getting offensive rebounds, limiting turnovers is going to be really big for a team that isn't going to be high volume from three and doesn't have great isolation scoring. You need that shot volume. So I'm going to say better, but I I don't think this is a given. I think Jawan was a really good offensive rebounder. Romeo got his fair share of offensive rebounds in there too. So I think some things need to happen, and I think as Race Thompson plays more minutes, you know that'll go up. And I think Justin Smith is the key here. 
I don't see any reason why Justin Smith isn't a 10% offensive rebound and percentage guy. Can't go in there and get two or three a game like he did. He did not rebound well overall against Gannon, but he got two and he finished. And he is 95th, 96th percentile as a guy turning offensive rebounds into points. That's got to happen. And so I think if Indiana is going to be good and make the tournament, this number will be higher. You talk about a, a defensive struggle with the bigs, uh, Hunter and Smith guarding the threes, and offensive rebounding advantage uh, with those guys being able to go in and, and get some rebounds over, uh, you know, other players if 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 they're um, you know playing that three spot if that's the way Archie goes. Yep. All right. Uh, next up, Devonte Green averaged fifteen point five points per game. Uh, or no, that's the over under fifteen point five points per game. He averaged nine point four per game last season. Uh, as the president of the Devonte Green fan club, uh, I'm actually going to go under on this. I don't think we're going to have anybody who's going to average fifteen points. I think Devonte is going to have a great season. I think he's going to have some games where he probably pops for twenty four, twenty five, twenty six points. But he'll also have probably some games where he scores six, seven, eight when the shots just aren't falling. So I would and there's I, other people to absorb scoring too. Yeah, yeah, there are. Well, we certainly hope so. So I think well, he'll yeah, be more in the, if he's scoring fifteen point five points per game, this team's probably in trouble. I yeah. mean, the other guys should be contributing a lot. So I mean, that was what we said that was going to make this team better than last year. A year ago was the balance in scoring yeah. the in the attack so i'm gonna go under as well yeah you know and look i think there are that's going not to be on no that's... not at all i think there are probably going to be six seven or eight games this year where he has to score 20 plus for us to win because some other things just aren't happening but i think there's going to be other matchups where we're dominating down low where the best thing for him to do is get the ball inside get it to other guys and maybe he scores eight to ten and i think a big reason why i'm so confident is i feel like he'll be better at picking those spots this year at least that's the hope, and I think that would be in Indiana's best interest. So I'm going under, but it's not because I don't believe in his scoring ability. Same thing as you said, Ryan. I'm going to go Coach. under, and the thing, too, is sometimes you don't have to score points to score points for your team. Just by the spacing uh, and having to pay attention to him can open up other scores, and that's what you take from the Marquette scrimmage and, and the Gannon game is that a lot of people are able to make some shots and, and score and different people at different nights is going to be a big thing. And if you have to guard the number one player, uh, 13, 14 points a game, if he gets to that, is enough to, to help Indiana score another way. So I, I think he's going to be under. All right, next up, Al Durham. Last season shot 34.8% from three. This season, will he be better or worse? Coach, why don't you go first on this one? Better. I, I like this shot. Uh, in the times that I've seen him so far, there's a lot more elevation. There's a lot more arch on it. I think his follow through is nice. I think the ball, I always like to see shooters, how soft the ball lands around the rim. And, and I think that um, uh, what I've seen, his, his shot looks a lot uh, softer. So um, he's going to have increased opportunities, which could lower that a little bit and still be effective at 34 or 33 and a half. But I, I do think he's going to be over that. I'm going to go under. I think the volume will be up, but I think there may be a dip in percentage. Let's remember the line is going back a little bit, which, ten, which tends to you know drop percentages just a little bit. And the other thing with Al is I think we're going to see more of him going to the basket this year. And he has been a guy who has been nicked up, had some hand injuries, had some wrist injuries. And I think last year he would have shot a lot better if he didn't get, you know, get injured in the Michigan State game. And that hurt him for four, five, six games. And if he's driving to the basket more, absorbing more contact, there's a higher likelihood of that. So to me, there's a few factors that kind of point a little bit of a red flag. I still think he'll be a better shooter overall because he'll produce more. But I think the efficiency in terms of three point percentage will actually probably, I would, I would bet it goes down a little bit, but I don't think it'll be too much. Well, I don't want to upset our dedicated uh, listener and buddy Joel. So I'm going to say over, he's the president of the elder fan club. So I'm going, I'm going long time president of the, yeah, Alderham so fan I'm, club. I'm going over uh, just, just for Joel. Okay. But no, I think, I think I, Al is uh, going to get a lot of opportunities to catch and shoot this year, and I think that's when he was at his best last year. So, um, and also on the break, stepping into shots, he looked really good a few times last year. Michigan State, uh, Wisconsin game, I think it was. He looked really good on the break, just stepping right into a shot. So I, I think that it's going to go up. You're right. The line going back is the calculus we don't know about. Um, but it's not like they sprung this on these guys. The Lines have been moved back for months now. They've been able to practice that. So I'm going to go. He's a, he's a, he also hasn't been a guy like Devontae that typically takes shots two, three feet behind the line either. So I right. think it could potentially affect. Sure, and, and that's a, 
completely fair assessment. I um, I'm going to say it's probably going to end up roughly about the same, but a little above. I'm like 35.5 or something like that. I'm not I'm not saying he's going to make a huge jump. You also need to fully disclose the fact that your girlfriend is a huge Al Durham. Fan, huge Al Durham. That could be influencing. It might be some of your some of it your might thoughts be. on Al the other room right now watching this. So. <laughs> Uh, okay, Trace Jackson Davis, six and a half rebounds per game, over or under? Uh, Ryan, under. why don't you go first? No, not, not way under. I'm gonna say under. I, I just think the rebound is gonna be spread around on this team. I, I don't. It's not. It's not a knock on Trace. Maybe as a sophomore, he's up there, but I, I think that that it's it's gonna be spread around on this team. The rebounding. Yeah, I agree. I'm gonna go, I'm I, gonna go I, under. Okay, uh, because the minutes too. They're they're gonna have a rotation of minutes. Um, so much competition for big guy minutes on this team. Yeah. Um, so Damn, I, I thought I was going to be, be the under. outlier. I thought I was going to be the outlier going under here, but I agree. That's a lot of rebounds as an average. It, it is a lot of rebounds. For and, a freshman, and, especially. Yeah. And minutes, he's going to have some ups and downs. I mean, he's going to have some games where he just doesn't produce that much. You know, we know freshmen do that. So, yeah, I'm going under on that one as well. Yeah. This, this was a, a mediocre line set by Jay. That is a pretty mediocre line. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> uh, okay. Rob Finnessy, four assists per game over or under. He averaged 2.9 assists per game last season, although, as we've said many times, pre concussion, he was up over four assists per game. Uh, and for context, Yogi averaged 3.9 assists his sophomore season. Coach, are you going uh, over or under four assists per game for Rob? Man, I, I love Rob, and, and I would love to see it over four, and I, I think he can. That, that's that's a great line, actually. I'm going to say a little bit under, um, but you know, with the ball moving and the ball popping and, and less isolation plays than that, there might be more opportunities for assists on made baskets for Indiana, and, and, and he's a pretty good post feeder, but I'm going to say slightly under. The only wild card here is his health early in the season. Like if he plays, you know, not as many minutes, if he's in, as tentative as he was in the exhibition game. But once he gets back to full strength and, you know, kind of full wind, I absolutely think over. So I'm, I'm going over on this one. I'm going under. I think that, uh, I think he's going to get a lot of hockey assists this year. If there if there were hockey assists, I think that this would be way over because I think he's going to do a lot of passing on the perimeter and finding guys on the perimeter who can then dump it into the post. I know he's good at dumping it into the post, um, but I'm going to go under just slightly. I think he's probably going to hit that Yogi number around there, about 3.9, between like 3.5 and 3.9. I don't think he's going to be over four. Okay, uh, let's hit these next few rapid fire. Justin Smith, three and a half free throw attempts per game. Over or under, he averaged two free throw attempts per game last season. Uh, Ryan, you're going under. Coach, what are you saying? I'm over. I'm oh, man. I'm going under. I, I mean, it's a great sign for Indiana if it's over, but I kind of yeah, sure. I kind of want to say, and there will be games where he will, yes. but it's the consistency of it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go slightly under, but I, that's definitely one I hope I'm wrong on. Um, Armand Franklin, 14 minutes per game over or under six guys averaged more than 14 minutes per game last season. And two were just under 14 minutes per game. And we know about Indiana's depth in the backcourt. Ryan Armand Franklin under, under. coach over. Mm. Yeah. I just, I think that the two, it's a hard guard, number. This, the two sets a tough number because this two starting guard is going to play a lot if they're healthy. And I'm assuming health here. Yeah, but that's the thing. You can't just assume I, I health. I mean, that that's You're, the thing. I, I think he's good enough, and I think there will be nicks and dings. I think he's going to end up playing more than that. And well, I think I, I think they love his defense, too, and that's yeah. going to get him on the court. I was going to say that real quick. What I've seen is he's been quick to get to a, a level uh, as a freshman. That reminds me a little bit of Rob. Not as good as it's carved out uh, a, a little bit of that you know six seven eight minutes a half that's going to be a close number but i i think um i think he goes over jay said in the chat i really hit my stride with these last few numbers you did yes. these were these were stiff numbers uh, okay and finally over under 18 and a half regular season wins for iu this season does not include the big 10 tournament uh, which just as well because we never win in the Big Ten tournament, yeah, anyways. It That's, <laughs> that makes no difference. <laughs> the, the, uh, line, the line, no, but it's seventeen and a half, and has been bet up to eighteen and a half where it sits over. currently. Over for sure. Over. I'm going over too. 
over or I'm going to be miserable in like February. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, I think a lot of it is going to hinge on health, but I'm, I'm going to trust them. I'm going to say over. I think this team gets to 20-plus wins. All right, that was fun. Jay, really good questions. That was a much better than mediocre uh, question that you put in. Took, took you a lot of time, so we appreciate you it. You said it was better than advertised, Jared? I didn't, but we could. It was, we'll go with better than advertised. That's a callback. Look at that. Look at that book. Buy it on Amazon. Better than advertised. The story of the 2016 Indiana Hoosiers. All right. Coming up in our third and final segment, we're going to answer your questions, including one about what scares us the most about this upcoming season, where the blame should fall for Indiana's continuous string of injuries, and then several other Halloween-themed questions. See how many we can get to. Stick with us on the Assembly Call. Ethan Happ, and I never listen to the assembly call, especially the episodes that Ryan is on. Thanks, Ethan. Welcome back to the assembly call. I'm Jared Morris here with Ryan Phillips and the coach Brian Tonsoni. Ryan, maybe next year you go as Ethan Happ for Halloween, or maybe you go as an official that calls a travel on Ethan Happ. It's like a real, you know, like a. I know that, I that, that, referee, you'd have to explain that to people. But. With as critical <laughs> as I am of referees, if I put on a referee shirt at this point, it's bound to just burst into flames so uh remember that you need to be subscribed to our email newsletter we send out a weekly iu news roundup even during the off season and after every game we send out a detailed post-game analysis text iu to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com that's iu to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com all right guys mailbag time all these questions submitted via our private iu basketball discussion community at assemblycall.com slash community first one is from bill what scares you the most about the upcoming season? Coach, why don't you lead off? Oh, Jared, you muted yourself. Was it? Well, halfway I was gonna, through that question. Oh, halfway. Sorry. Uh, coach, yeah. why don't you go? Um, I just, I, I'm, I'm nervous. As you guys saw for me when the injury kind of talk come out about the guards, I, I just don't think we have the depth at the guard position to withstand injuries. And even though our advantage is in the post guard depth and, and the game's a guards game and you need guards. So I guess that scares me the most. Um, um, other than that, I've been pretty pleased. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it's guard health is number is, is number one, two and three for me, I think. And, and just the development of the, of the outside shooting, I think, because you can always, you know, when things are going bad, if you can knock down shots, uh, it, it tends to make things go a little better. And, and so, um, as we talked about with the, with the, you know, effective field goal percentage, you hit a couple threes and your effective field goal percentage shoots way up because of the, the adjusted, uh, nature of, of the stat. So I, I would say that uh, it would be guard health and just three point shooting. It's got to be better than last year. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, that was my answer too. Uh, okay. From David, what will likely be the most difficult aspect of IU's defense for Armand and Trace to master? How long will that learning curve uh, take? Like, you know, t- for them to kind of get up to speed, do you think, coach? You know, you know there, there's a lot about defense at the next level that's different than high school, but uh, I think like guarding actually the, playing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the big key is, is, is getting in a system, but, I think guarding the ball, uh, knowing how to guard your yard, the term that's used to, to, to angle people away from the basket. Uh, athletes, uh, there's so many athletes in the game now that can handle the ball with good speed and go downhill. I think that's really tough, especially for uh, uh, Trace uh, if he's guarding out on the perimeter. And then the ball screen, how to guard appropriately at the ball screen, whether you're going under, you're going over. Those things are, are difficult for people who guard perimeters. Um, Ryan, I'm going to throw this question to you first. This is from Richard with all the injuries last year. And so far this year, should we question the tactics of the training staff? I think that's fair. Um, you know, if it's an issue ongoing this year, look, preseason injuries happen. They, they happen every year to every team, I think in in some shape or form. I mean, look, if, if an injury had happened to a big guy and not one of our guards, I think, I don't think anybody would be would be thinking twice because we have depth there. Uh, you know, if, if a guy like Race Thompson had a, a sprained ankle or something, it wouldn't be that big a deal because you've got so many other guys who can go in and step in for them. The fact that it's happening at the guard position, yeah, is concerning because of the lack of depth here. Um, I would wait a couple weeks before you start getting the, the 
you know, torches and pitchforks out. But yeah, it's fair to ask, you know, are they going too hard in practice? Are they, you know, maybe in their, in the weight room, maybe doing a little too much? Um, do they need to back off guys? Maybe give them one day where it's a walkthrough day or something like that. If injuries keep happening and keep coming up, you have to start looking at yourself and asking why. Now we had a bad year last year and that happens. So I would wait and to, some fluky injuries, you know? Yeah. And I would, I would wait a few weeks before sort of freaking out in this season. Um, now, if we're in December and it's a litany of injuries like last year, yeah, it's fair to ask what's going on, what's causing this, how are these happening, where are these happening, when are these happening? You know, um, it's it's fair to start looking into that. But right now, I, I wouldn't be that f- freaking out about it that much. Season hasn't even started yet. You know, we could see Devonte and and everybody healthy for the opener. We don't know yet, so let's see. Coach, what do you think about that? Um, you know, I, I think the, there's professionals and the trainers on every staff are, you know, there's people being held out of exhibitions all across the country. You get natural bumps and bruises. Um, I think we jump to a conclusion that it's the training because it's happened a lot in a short amount of time. Well, it's and easy I'm just to blame too. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just as guilty of that. Um, but as a coach, we have changed some of the way we do things, uh, charge drills and things like that, because at the high school level, there's a couple key dudes you can't get hurt on a, you know, but then you balance that with how do you get toughness in, in your program? If you're not diving on the floor or taking charges in practice, how are you going to do that in the game? That is a fine line to handle in injury prevention for coaches. And it's, I don't know that it's an easy solution. All right. Last question. Uh, let's go with this one, Ryan, what Halloween, this is from Michael, what Halloween costume from your youth are you most proud of? I don't even remember a lot of my Halloween costume. I was thinking about this as I saw him. I don't even remember a lot of mine. Um, and I figured when I was reading, I was like, oh yeah. And then I, I thought about it. I, I went as an Ewok one year when I was really young. I thought that was good. My sister did Princess Leia and I was an Ewok. I think that was probably my, my best one. That's good. Coach, we got about 10 seconds left. What's the one that you uh, my youth was so long ago that it's left my memory. <laughs> You can't remember any of them. <laughs> no, you ever, you, I, don't even know, I don't even know if I had a youth. <laughs> okay. That's a good note that's to it. end on. We're done. No more questions. <laughs> All right. That's going to do it for us on this week's episode of the Assembly Call. If you want to see us do the show live, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to Bob Thompson, as always, for producing most of the music that you hear on the show. And thank you for listening. We will talk to you again next Thursday night. Actually, we'll talk to you on Tuesday night for the first game of the year. Until then. Take it from me, James Blackman Jr. Keep your elbows in, eyes on the rim, and get buckets. Go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. I have a mad crush on Coach Roberts. <laughs> Mine is uh, one year. You, you guys remember Rob Turner, who led Indiana to the 1988 Liberty Bowl uh, win? He was. I know that name. But was, I, know. Um, I mean, there's been lots of guys named Rob Turner, but he was the wide receiver for Indiana in 88. So I used to, I would always go for Halloween. I would just go like to the IU football equipment room and like get pads and pants and a jersey. And the one I remember most is the number 25 jersey, which I'm pretty sure was Rob Turner's jersey. Or maybe that was Lance Brown. I went as Lance Turner Brown was once. Though. Turner, Turner, I think Lance was Brown was twenty five too. So he was always one of my favorite players because he was my dad's player, defensive back. Lance Brown was a great player. Played with the Steelers for a while. Um, we have a couple other questions, real quick, Ryan. Do you have right. a, a few moments? Sure. sure okay, sure. let's hit. Let's hit a couple of these other ones really quick. Um, okay, I didn't what, say it on the show, but Chad reminded us there's a replay tomorrow on Big Ten Network of the Gannon. If you want, oh, to are they me. actually? playing it because they said yeah, they weren't Chad, going to nice Chad, Chad said something in here um that's what they say because they want everybody to sign up make sure to mention that the game is being replayed on big 10 network friday at 9 a.m i believe that's probably 9 a.m eastern so if you want to go dvr that sorry to interrupt but cool no that's good no that's good that. good info that is good um okay I what use, i i use soccer is playing for the big 10 title at some point too this weekend so support them you know it's sunday michigan state uh, I don't know, 3 p.m. Eastern. Go find it on, on Big Ten Network. Nice. Okay, uh, from Jeff, what IU player, past or present, will you dress up as for Halloween? Um, ooh. Hmm. I've got a good one. Hmm. 
<laughs> you know, it'd be a funny one, <laughs> really funny one that what? you should do, Jared, because of your Twitter activity. Dan Dockage would be a funny one. God, <laughs> no, you that is dumbass. Dumb wear a number, wear a number, <laughs> wear a number eleven jersey, and then just a donkey's head. Be a jackass. <laughs> Come on, that's good. Um, San Diego gonna, chicken. What? I'm gonna. <laughs> I don't know. Jordan Halls would be a good one. Cody Zeller would be a good one. I'm gonna go with Ivan Renko. Yeah, of course. I'm gonna dress up as Ivan Renko. You got a lot of freedom to kind of make that costume up. Yeah. You know that would be funny. What coach, about you, Coach? Who are you dressing up as? I, I'd either want to be Uve Blob. Just. Because or Brian Sloan, so I could just go out and jump into people and screen them hard and knock people down. Like you know how people used to dunk on people in in on the street. You could just go in and screen people. You know, you know on Halloween. What is this guy doing running in? It's okay. He's Brian Sloan. That's he's that's, Brian Sloan. That's Street forty five. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's what he does. I like that. I like that. Um, okay, so here's kind of a serious question from Scott. And Ryan, this will give us a chance real quick here to maybe clear up some misconceptions. Scott says the NCAA announced they'll have a program in place for pr- for players profiting on name and likeness. I see no possible way the NCAA can control this all. I believe they or uh, all I believe that they will do is screw it up. Example being Duke will get away with murder while Seton Hall or in Iowa will have a microscope up their rear end. That's actually kind of an accurate description of how college basketball works. Uh, uh, but Bruce says, what is going to stop a Kentucky booster with a car dealership to offer 500000 to a kid to shoot a commercial? This is going to be a disaster. So first, well, let's clear up what the NCAA actually said. Because yeah, they didn't approve anything, guys. Yeah, yeah. It was basically a symbolic vote to say they would explore sort of looking into. And they also said to do it in a way that's consistent with a collegiate model. Well, if you're consistent with a current collegiate model, you're not going to let kids get anything. So, um, yeah, I mean, while that was a symbolic vote in the right direction, it wasn't really much. There was no substance to it. So let's wait before we start praising the NCAA for doing the right thing or whatever. The NCAA is going to be backed into a corner because not only did California pass something, but a bunch of other states are starting to pass are, are already advancing bills to say the same thing that athletes can um, can go ahead and benefit from their name, you know, image and likeness. Um, so to answer Bruce's question, uh, I think that he's right uh, that boosters could pay kids money. Uh, one, that's the boosters money. I don't really care what they do with it. And they're probably already paying people anyway. So if it's out in the open, that would be better than the situation is now. That's one. Two, um, I would say that maybe the NCA makes a rule that says you can't get money from a booster. You can only get money from a brand that is not associated with the school in any way. I think that's a fair way to do it to say that, you know, you can get paid by a Nike or an Adidas or a, you know, whatever that is not. If you go to Oregon though, guess what? Phil Knight's a booster. You can't sign a Nike deal. If you go to Oregon, if you want to go to college and sign a Nike deal, you're going to have to go somewhere else. Um, I, as long as the kids know what they're signing up for when they get in, they can't really complain about it. If that rule is in place and then you go to Oregon and say, well, I can't sign a Nike deal. Why not? Well, you knew the rules when you entered into this deal to go to Nike. Um, so that's one way to do it. I don't know if that's going to be the, the way they pick it. I'm not suggesting that's the great way to do it. Some people have said, well, if a booster wants to pay that much to a player for their image and they, you know, I mean, here's the thing. If a booster is shooting a commercial for a, a car dealership and he in, pays a kid inordinately too much money, that kind of falls on the booster because, you know, you can justify that by saying, well, I'm going to get this, make this much money back in commercial sales from from this commercial you know i'm going to sell more cars because of this kid and therefore it evens out for me so it's a worthwhile expense but if they're willing to throw around their money at a few at a very small group of players fine you know i mean it, it, getting the the highest ranked recruit isn't always the way you win in major conferences in major college athletics these days and they for the most part already do it's not like they're going to get yeah. 20 extra scholarships like they still I mean, can only yeah, fill so many Kentucky can only sign what is it, a total of like 13 scholarships is it 12 scholarships or 13 i don't i don't even remember the number or 11 anymore. if you just want to you know hold two yeah. open <laughs> so you can only have a certain amount of scholarship players anyway. So if you're willing to pay a million dollars, if you're a booster, you're willing to hand out a million dollars to all 12 of those players. Guess what? They're all probably going to be on campus for about a year or two. You're not going to get that much return on your investment. That's bad business. 
um, if you're doing it from a business perspective. Plus, by the time this comes in, guys, the guys will be able to go straight to the NBA anyway. So you won't even yeah. be getting the top so, of the top so, guys. So I get the concerns. I absolutely get the concerns that you know certain uh, you know schools are going to be big winners in all this. Well, guess what? All the five star guys already go to Kentucky, Duke, and UNC and Kansas anyway. So it's not going to change anything. Uh, it's it's really not going to alter anything. Um, Alabama, Clemson. And, you know, whatever other Oklahoma or whoever else already get all the top football prospects. So it's really not going to change much. What it does, though, is it allows these kids, many of whom come from at best middle class upbringings to make some money off of the fact off of the things that other people are making money off of. So um, it's just here's here's a couple of things that I want to ask. One, two, if the market was five hundred thousand, they'd be getting it from shoe people right now. Yeah, that's Um, that's the other thing. They're already getting money. And the thing is, it's coming from people who support the university instead of people who are making profit off of shoes. I don't know that I like either one as a traditional old person, uh, but I'd rather have a person affiliated with the university supporting their university by paying money than some outside force. The, The only reason they're doing this is to get a future client. Uh, that that's one thing. And I saw this on Twitter today and I don't know who to credit it to. So it's not my own. But it could benefit schools by kids staying earlier instead of going to the draft and then ending up in the G League to get some money. Or do, um, And someone referenced the, the young guy at um, the Shumo or whatever at Illinois that if you can make some money while you're in college, you might stay at Illinois um, and finish yeah. your degree it, and make some money on the side. If you make fifty to 100000 or something like that uh, in advertisements, that's something I never thought about. It, mm-hmm. And I, would, I don't know that I want boosters not to because Tim Priller – could have had a lucrative career selling slinging mother bears pizzas or whatever else and, and every, from the boosters there and why not um yogis at yogis I, I mean i've changed i've changed so much on this but um here's the I, thing I just, yeah, I, it, th- 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 let me say one thing real quick because i think one other kind of thing one other consequence of this that i think will be really good is think about where the money would go right like take anthony leal if anthony leal had gone to stanford is he going to get a whole lot of endorsements in palo alto no No. he's going to get endorsements locally where people know him and so i think what you would start to see is more guys staying local and going to college closer to home because they would have more opportunities like that and i think college sports are better when you have more guys staying home playing for the home state school so I think that's also something else that would that would kind of. And be I think an I agree that that'll happen at the lower levels of recruiting. I don't think it's going to happen with the five. The five star guys are always going to no, go. No, but the, five stars are different. That, exactly. That's not what I'm talking different. about. I'm talking about a guy at Anthony Leal's level. Different breed. And yeah. and um, what what I will say is that these kids have been. Yeah, I, I I love when people come at me and say they're getting sixty thousand dollars a year in education. Well, the education only costs that much because that's the price the university sets on it. Okay. University is not paying, is not handing these people a $60,000 check. 30 something thousand of that is free to the university. It's a spot in a classroom at a desk. The things that materially cost the university money are paying for their food, uh, books, and then technically putting them up in an apartment where they could be getting that much, you know, getting rent or whatever from somebody else. That's all it costs the university. So 30,000 of that 60,000 is a made up number by the university that is basically what it costs to have somebody sitting at a desk in class. Okay. That could cost $5. There are some schools in this country you can go to where it costs $5 a unit and there's somewhere it costs thousand dollars a unit or whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous system. So saying that the university is already paying this much money for these people, not paying that much. It's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a fabricated number that universities are coming up with and it's growing exponentially because universities knows they can get away with it because people have to go to college. So I, you know, absolutely understand that the universities are giving these kids an education and that is certainly valuable. Um, But it wasn't valuable to somebody like Zion Williamson. Zion Williamson could have gone professional out of college basketball. Now he can go to Duke later on, but if he goes and makes millions of the millions in the NBA, he's going to be able to go to Duke. If he wants any, he would have been able to go to Duke or Harvard or wherever else he wanted to later on. Um, I just think that we need to understand that education in this country is not what it was 30 years ago, where if you work and scrape hard, you can, you know, pay your way through college and all that stuff. It's a different situation these days. Um, and so I think that saying you're getting 
let's say it's thirty thousand dollars a year, you're getting one hundred and twenty thousand dollars from the university. No, you're not. You're getting a value based on what the university says is one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So these kids are getting a valuable service, which is education. But at the same time, the university is making far more off of them than they are giving up in their education. And I think that these kids are valuable. They make millions and, and you know, taken as a collective, billions of dollars for other people and get to have their name and likeness. All right. Good night, folks. <laughs> I'm out of here. You wanted me to answer the no, question. Was, I'm the sorry. Question. That, was, that was poor form by me. It was a good but answer. It's, <laughs> but it's just one of those things where it, it, these kids, if they're able to make money off their name and likeness, why are we not? Why would we stand in the way? And, uh, you know, I don't get it because every, because other people are allowed to use it, use their name, use their likeness, use their image and make tons of money. But these kids can't because of some stupid rule that the NCAA cooked up and some stupid idea of amateurism. And, and you know, they have to go behind the scenes to make the money that is probably rightfully theirs from people. And then when they get caught, they get blacklisted and banned. You know, it's it's ridiculous to me. I agree. I agree with you. Coach agrees. Even with I, his, I, I've just I've just changed because I don't so know. That it's, Honestly, I don't mm-hmm. know that it's going to be hundreds and thousands of dollars, and, I, and it's probably been done in the past. And, and if if the NCA puts too many rules, then they're back to a thick book of regulations that they're they're only going to nitpick on the schools they want to catch and and look the other way on the schools that that they don't. And, and I just think. You know, um, and maybe it's not just basketball players, but maybe, you know, if if a hundred or two hundred bucks gets thrown at a um, a soccer player for an advertisement or something, I, I don't know that that's really all that bad. And, and these athletes put in time um, and then they put in time on top of that. They're a 20 hour rule, but then they study film and they do things on their own. And, and so that's the difference between my son attending Indiana State. Uh, and, and IU as a regular student, um, you know, th- there's there's some benefits that um, that that I think they need to get. And um, I, I don't know that I would have said this a year or two ago, um, but I've just tried to be open minded uh, about it. And and the thing that gets me is the millions of dollars that come in from Big Ten Network and the shoe deals and the, the Adidas deals for schools and the, the gear stuff that happens. And people are making lots of money. Yeah, off of what these young kids are doing, and I think they're just going to get a small sliver of it. And- well, and it's it's essentially a full time job. Being a yeah. you know, people say like, well, they're just normal students, and that that bastardizes being normal students. They're nothing like normal students. If you knew any athletes in school, they are nothing like normal students. They work pretty much a twenty hour day if you include classes every day. Mm-hmm. And it's it's pretty ridiculous, and, and they get some perks, but they have a lot of pressures. You know, like exactly. it goes both They're ways. Essentially, university employees that that's what they essentially are, and they don't get paid like it. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say about this: it's important to like make sure this is framed the right way. This is not universities like writing checks to players for oh. extra money. It's just getting the hell out of the way so they can get the money that they could go get on their own. Like stop, you know, like stop legislating. These guys can't go make money that they could get because someone's going to pay them. Just get out of the way and let them go yeah, do their thing over on their here. own. Yeah. All right. Well, so, we're all, we're all in agreement on this. Yeah, I think so. That was good stuff. Okay. Very last question. Favorite Halloween candy. It was asked. It was on the list. Reese's. Yeah. Reese's. If it's chocolate, it's, it's, it's going into my, you know, bag at the shopping. Can't be uh, chocolate and peanut butter. Can't be chocolate and peanut butter. I thought that was going to go somewhere else, and it would have been a great drop. But <laughs> I, I what, you, what, you, what about you, Jim <laughs> Hopper? What's your favorite Halloween candy? Uh, I like Starburst too. I love Star- Starburst. Yeah, I do like Starburst. But probably if I if I could only do one, I think I'd go with a Snickers. Snickers is great. Snickers, Snickers is a classic. Is, it's just that's yeah, why you're solid. That's why you're never grumpy. You eat Snickers that's right. all the time. You, you don't wait till you're. <laughs> hangry you just eat them all the time and you get a positive vibe from eating snickers that's right um all right this was fun thanks for being here tonight guys thanks everybody for doing it an hour later that was uh much appreciated tuesday night iu western illinois are you guys available for that one i'll be here i should i should be yeah okay i so am hated okay 
Well, hopefully you're still recovering from Saturday night. You know, all that tailgating, big victory. Let's, man, let's Dude, I, it takes me 48 hours these days to recover. Yeah. That, you wait, you guys, you young bucks here. You still have some recovery. You have quick recovery, man. When you get over 50, it's hard. I felt I'm, like I've over 50 since I was 27. So My goodness. I'm already noticing that the recovery takes longer. Uh, it doesn't stop me from doing it, though, because <laughs> hey, maybe I'm just dumb, but I don't yeah. know. Let's go. Do we have a good feeling about Saturday? I do. I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> North, it, look, if Northwestern's offense scores more than 17 points, there's a problem. It's a real serious problem. Yeah. They're it's, a bad, bad team. Is Penix going to play? Does anybody know. know? I don't know. I haven't heard. I, I haven't heard. We'll probably find out by tomorrow, I'd assume, if not tonight. Final words of wisdom from Jay to close on. If you don't stop drinking, you can't get hung over. That's true. <laughs> I mean, that was kind of my philosophy for a couple of years in college. It was just... And while you lived in Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> no, Milwaukee, I would definitely just hate life the next day. I was, I was, at that point, I was too old for, for the uh, constant stream. It's like... It's, uh, Sterling Archer says, it's like, I think if I stop drinking, the cumulative hangover would literally kill me. <laughs> uh, all right, everybody. We will talk to you Tuesday night after IU Western Illinois. Hopefully we have some guards ready to play that night. Yep. Later, guys. See y'all. See you guys.